Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the, let's say, 29th day of November in the year of our Lord, 2023. And this is take three, by the way. Yeah, it's getting late. It's almost uh, almost 8 o'clock a.m. So if you see me with my cup of coffee, that's because it's early. And I started this like 4 o'clock this morning, earlier, 4.30, 3, 3, 3 o'clock. Okay, so, <clears throat> yes, I know, I'm strange. That's, that's why I do videos like this. <laughs> I'm going to do a video on a very important thing. It's a little technical, but it's very important, and you will learn something. I'll guarantee it if you listen to this video. You will learn the answer to the question that has divided Christians for millennia now, including Protestants from Protestants, not just Protestants from Rome, but Protestants from Protestants. When Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body, what did he mean, this is my body? Did he mean the, the bread is his body, which is what Rome says, what uh, Orthodox Lutherans say, probably some other people out there. Or was Zwingli, who got in the argument with Luther, Luther said, Luther said, let me uh, read Luther's here. Uh, Luther was insisting, hoc est corpus meum. This is in Latin, because the Mass was in Latin, of course. Uh Francis is determined to destroy Roman Catholicism, which is another reason why this is very important for you to listen to. Hoc est corpus meum, that is the institution, in the, when, the, when the priest says those words with the wafer in his hand, the wafer, according to Roman Catholic doctrine, becomes the body, blood, and soul, and divinity of Christ. The body, blood, soul, and divinity. They don't just say, this is my body. <clears throat> uh, Lutherans, at least Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, according to the Formula of Concord, says that Christ is present in, with, and under the bread. What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> Sounds like it's not actually there, but... Huh. The doctrine of transubstantiation, which is based on the Aristotle, the philosopher Aristotle and his metaphysics, it talks about things being substance and accidents. Substance has to do with what something actually is, the isness of the thing, and the accidents has to do with the appearance, uh, things that can change. For example, I am me, but this shirt is not me. This is an accident. According to Aristotle, it just happens to be accidentally what I'm wearing today, even if it was deliberate. It's, it's still not me. It's not me. My glasses are not me. Uh, I am me. Uh, that's it. So the substance of me is me, and everything else that happened to be wearing is an accident. Uh, it has to do with appearance. Appearance is not me. Is not even my outward appearance. I can that can change, and I can still be me. So the 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 actual that's what they mean by substance. So if you're in the creed. Uh, the, you're talking about the, uh, the the doctrine of Trinity that the three uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one substance or one essence that comes from Aristotle. It's true, but it comes from Aristotle. It's his system of metaphysics, his his ideas, his classification of things. They're arbitrary, but yeah, it comes from man, not from the Scripture. So the, the transubstantiation, the Catholic Church says it, it, it becomes literally the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, both the wine and the uh, the wafer. It's interesting that the, the uh, priest only holds up one wafer. What happens to what everybody else eats? <laughs> I wonder, that's a little, are we being cheated? I'm not a Catholic, but I, I was wondering that. Hmm. Hmm. How does that work? I don't know. Uh, he actually is the one that eats the wafer he holds up, too. <sighs> and it was unleavened bread, by the way. Uh, the Orthodox in the East use leavened bread. The Passover was unleavened bread. This is a Passover meal, which is part of the clue to how we should understand it. It was the Passover meal. So this, this division of between, is it actually, does the bread turn into Jesus Christ or not? Or his body? Do, is it or not? When Jesus said, this is my body, did he mean that literally the bread that he was holding in his hand became the body, the physical body of Jesus Christ, which is a Catholic doctrine, which is Lutheran doctrine, 
and some others, sacramental sacramentarians, those hold to a sacramental system. Yeah, and you literally eat Jesus Christ. For Catholics, body, blood, soul, and divinity. That's how you get them in you. You eat them physically, and he, this is a this. They believe this is a true sacrifice. Technically, it's not a new sacrifice for Catholics. It is a representation of Christ in a on bloody manner. So you're taking, uh, yeah, it's complicated, but they, they sort of take it. Yes, the one Christ was crucified once and for all, but in this we are taking that and representing it and and re-crucifying him in a real. It's a real sacrifice in their theology. Again, even though it's part of the same, I don't want to misrepresent them. I'm trying to represent them as they as they try to teach it. And we literally uh, ingest him. Um, sacraments are all about physical things. It's like, how does water save you? It's is it a, it's you know people that are. A little bit skeptical about some of these things. There's a reason for it, but yeah. Uh, so and this is divided. Like right now, I mean, I'd like to. I, I sort of like the uh, one the Lutheran Church Missouri Center down the street. Uh, their liturgy is rather odd for me. It's it's and it's sung. The the pastor sings it. He can sing better than I can, <laughs> but I I don't mind. I it's the the worship that I've been experiencing lately in the Baptist church is so shallow. It is. It's so, it's man-centered. They, they pick songs. They don't pick songs to glorify Christ. I'm, I'm not a member there, so I don't feel like I should go to people there and say, why are you not doing this better? Which I would. <laughs> I don't, I, I, I suspect though they have certain requirements in their membership that would separate me from them too. Uh, like uh, some sort of a membership covenant or a, a statement of faith that has things that are not taught in the Bible in it, which would prevent me from officially becoming a member. I wouldn't be surprised at all. And I, I almost don't want to know about those things because then I will not take to them so kindly. <laughs> who are you to limit who can come. It's like the, the issue of this, What it, it's, I find it exceedingly expense, uh, offensive. Uh, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, the local minister here cannot change that. I've had a discussion with him on that, and he, he, does, he has to believe in their doctrine, uh, or he would be defrocked or whatever they do in Lutheran churches. Uh, this is central to it because this, this is not uh, evangelical, uh, let me see, what do, we, what do we call it? The um, a pietistic, modern evangelical style Lutheranism, which exists. There are churches out there that are members of, for example, the Association of Free Lutheran Churches. There's one around here. It's about 30 miles away, though. Uh, and I've looked at it on, on the it's a traditional church. They probably, I'm going to guess they were ELCA and bailed. <laughs> before the whole thing goes down. Uh, <clears throat> Free Lutheran churches, my parents ended up being a member of one in their hometown of Janesville, Wisconsin, and I attended there several times with them, and it's like, yeah, I could go there. I don't know on this issue. It might, you know, there might be some things. I don't think that they are much more evangelical, in not in a Lutheran sense, but in a modern sense, and I don't remember the the pastor looking like a priest and no crucifix, things like that. So uh, <clears throat> this is an issue nowadays as as the current pope uh, deconstructs Roman Catholicism. He's destroying the whole thing. In fact, right now, his attack on the traditional mass, his attack on the core of the church, he's destroying the authority, all the authority. And Roman Catholicism exists. The foundation of Roman Catholicism is not the papacy. It is the mass, the transubstantiation, that the bread becomes the body and blood of Christ and soul and divinity. They've expanded it a bit. In fact, they've expanded it beyond uh, beyond the body. The bread is the body. Okay, we're going to look at that. What did Christ mean? 
But the re- the whole reason for a special priesthood is special people that have the authority and power to call down Jesus from heaven and transform him into bread and wine. Literally. The substance, the appearance, is, it stays the same. You know, like I was talking about the clothes I wear. So the appearance of the bread and wine is not altered, but the true substance of it, what it really is, is turned into the living Christ, which is why they have a monstrance, the sun-shaped thing with the window in the center, and they put a wafer in there, a consecrated wafer, and people are supposed to worship that as the living Christ. I'm not exaggerating. I'm trying to present their teaching as accurately as I can. I don't want to distort what they're saying. Uh, that would not be Christian. I don't want to mock them. We, we, we have to be prepared to accept these people because they're going to have to abandon ship. Because Francis is, well, he's, they're already pulling their hair out. What are we going to do over there? And he's rigged it so when he dies, whatever comes after him is going to be at least as bad. Uh, but, yeah, he's, he's in, in the process He's been working at it for some time of destroying Roman Catholicism as a Christian religion at all. And some of you say, well, Christians, Catholics aren't Christians. Well, who are they trusting in? If they're trusting in Christ, they're Christians. They believe in Christ, they're Christians. They might be doing it in sort of an odd way, a roundabout way, but if their trust is ultimately in Christ, if the Mass, if, if, if their trust is ultimately in the Church, uh, then they have a problem. But Francis is going to make that impossible. They're going to have to make a choice. Do they trust in Christ or they go completely pagan? Because that's where he's taking them. And he's been doing it in a very open way, especially since 2019, October of 2019, the Amazonian Synod, when he brought the Mother Earth pagan idols with the priests and priestesses, the shamans, and the Holy Canoe from the Amazon River into St. Peter's and paraded it around in front of the the high altar where the consecration of the wafer and stuff takes place, which is central to Catholic worship. He's desecrated the altar. And what happened the next month? covid what happened to the Vatican shortly thereafter? It was desolate, empty. Empty. Does that remind you of anything? Just suggesting. I don't know. It just seems to be like something. The abomination of desolation mentioned in the scriptures. Like it doesn't mean there's only one. Certainly was an abomination that made desolate of a type. But he's trying to destroy everything there. And I think as as non-Catholics, we be, need to be ready to and consider these things. Are we ready to receive them as our brothers and sisters if they confess Christ? Paul says, receive those who are weak in faith and not for the purpose of debating with them. Doubtful disputation, not for the purpose of, of uh, examining them over secondary things that aren't essential to salvation, like what kind of food they ate. If, if they're persnick, in that case, it was, are they vegetarians? Oh, you can't come here if you're vegetarian. Are we willing to, uh, to lower the lifeboats and, and help them uh, leave the Titanic before they go down with the ship? Or are we just going to stand back and smirk at them and say, you deserve it? Well, we deserve it too. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So let's look at this issue from the Word of God. Now, Catholicism, official Catholic doctrine, is that Vatican I, who gave the Pope— See, they created the the dilemma of what happens when when an immovable object meets an irresistible force— that philosophical, silly question. There's no such thing as an immovable object in an irresistible force other than God himself, and he is one and not opposed to himself. But so you have this 
this dilemma in, the, in Catholicism. Yet they affirm that the Scripture is fully inspired and infallible. But they also affirm that, it's, that their, their traditions are equal with that. But they don't affirm that their traditions are fully inspired and infallible. So in Vatican I, they created an infallible pope. Or they, cl they say the pope's infallible. When he is acting out uh, from his seat, in other words, when he's acting out of his capacity uh, as the bishop of Rome, as the teacher of the universal church, which is like an encyclical. When he's acting out of the office of the pope, not when he's ordering dinner, but when he's acting as the pope. He is infallible from my reading of Vatican I. People have tried to squash that down, but I don't think that's what it actually says. Now, is Vatican I the council infallible? No, 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 no. Otherwise, it would have always been taught from the beginning, right? Since the uh, doctrine never changes. It's always the same. Uh, no. So anyway, as this as Rome, uh, Roman Catholicism, in, the structure is going to implode. Uh, destroy the mass. There's no reason for the priests. What purpose do they serve? Uh, Francis is uh, deconstructing the authority structure. He's deconstructing uh, a tradition. He's deconstructing everything in order in favor of pagan idol worship, uh, the green agenda, socialist, globalist agenda. Uh, the eating of bugs, things like that. He's coming out with a revised, uh, I think, re Laudato C, uh, V2, version 2. I'm sure it won't be better. But are we ready to, to embrace people that, that, that are abandoning ship, who, who love Christ, and are, you know, just like Apollos was mighty in the words, but... Uh, Priscilla and Aquila, the married couple, took them uh, him aside and explained more accurately the things of Christ. Are we ready to do that? Are we ready to to not to receive them, uh, not for the purpose of doubtful disputation, to use a King James phrase, arguing with them over things that aren't consequence, essential things, non-essentials. I hope so. This might be a great opportunity. Will we will we meet the challenge? Will we show that we are brethren in Christ? Or will we show that we're a bunch of Pharisees? I don't know. We'll see. Assuming it all collapses, which it's in the process right now. And they're pulling their hair out. They're pulling their hair out because the very... Francis is... Ref, is destroying the very foundations of their faith because it's so tied into the the institution of the Roman Catholic Catholic Church outside of which is no salvation from their traditional point of view well outside of the church of Jesus Christ there's no salvation but they are not the church of Jesus Christ exclusively no but there are people there that are trusting in Christ even if it's mixed with some other stuff that shouldn't be there. But do we really want them to turn into Puritans? Do we want them to turn into Protestants? Or do we want them to turn into disciples of Christ and know the way more clearly? That's what I pray for. So let's let's deal. You know, I was thinking the other day, because of the offense of the LCMS, that I can't I, I'm not, even though the pastor recognized me as born again Christian. And would he say that if I, I might have even raised this point? So you mean that when I served communion at the nursing home, which I had done a little bit before then, uh, before COVID, uh, that's invalid because because I and they don't believe in the Lutheran concept of the presence of Christ in the bread and the wine. Really? How do you justify that by Scripture? He, he didn't quite go there. <laughs> he, he wasn't quite willing to say that. In other words, that would be tantamount to saying, I'm going to hell because I don't believe what you believe is a Lutheran. Well, there's some Lutherans that would go there. But growing up, it seemed to me there were Lutherans and there was everybody else. 
which is called heresy. That's what the Greek word heresis means. It means a party spirit, uh, a sect, uh, a group that, that follows a particular leader, like the Pope or Luther or Calvin or something like that, is exactly what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And what was his attitude toward that? Oh, that's just fine. Whatever they want, give it to them. Not quite. So let's examine this scripturally. I was thinking, hmm, does the Bible tell us something about that? Have, have we all been missing? I found that often a careful examination of the text and the context will tell you what is correct. Now, uh, Paul does talk about this, too, in the First Corinthians, I think, where he talks about um, taking it in an unworthy manner. And it doesn't mean that because you have sin. I think that's totally incorrect, too. Read it in context, uh, before and after, good chunk of context, and you'll find out what he's really talking about is all the division and fighting and suing one another and uh, greeting us and coming to, to the church. He says, you're coming to the church not for good, for better, but for worse. People coming there and some of them getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. They're bringing their, you know, plenty of wine for themselves. And it's real wine. You don't get drunk on grape juice. <laughs> and others, uh, uh, you know, then there was poor brethren that didn't have anything. They were they were going hungry. It was a common meal, too, apparently. So some of them were drunken gluttons, and they were ignoring their poor brethren that didn't have anything. They weren't discerning the body of Christ, the church. That's what the context. I had mentioned that to that Lutheran pastor, too, and he, he really didn't have an answer for that. He could see my point of view when I talked to him all these things. He, from, and I'm from the Scripture. I'm sola scriptura. Uh, scriptura nuda, I guess, is the, the correct. <laughs> the Scripture unclothed by human opinions is what I want. I want to know, what does God say? What does he mean? Okay, so let's take a look at this issue because it's divided Christian, Christians for well over a millennium. Uh, this issue, uh, the, the early church fathers used some language that would cause people to maybe read this back in there, but I think they were speaking spiritually and not literally. But carnal men only think literally. <laughs> so they always, you know, like dispensationalists say, they want everything to be literal. They can't, they cannot grasp spiritual language, apparently. <laughs> That's a mark of a child, a child that can't understand metaphor and, and you know, complicated use of language. Uh, when you say Jesus is a rock, and or, or elderly people often too, Jesus is a rock, and they say, "My Lord's not a rock." Yeah, that type of things. I remember that episode. It was it was a bit. I found that a bit amusing, but uh, you know, it's to be expected in a nursing home. Uh, <clears throat> nevertheless, let's get down to this. I tend to talk too long, as you know. So the the exact phrase in, in this case. It's not so much the content is the Greek itself is the the verse itself is explicit. We don't even have to look at the content or the context, I should say. The content of the verse is explicit in the Greek. Now, it's not in the Latin in the Vulgate. The Vulgate says "hoc est corpus meum," and "hoc" is the uh, Latin word. It's the uh, demonstrative pronoun. And in that particular word, it has several cases, uh, forms. These are gendered languages. These are they're not like English. English doesn't have this kind of structure. Uh, English has a lot more, uses word order and other things a lot more than other languages do. But anyway, the, the, as far as I can tell, and my Latin is, is pretty weak. I don't have a lot of resources in it because I don't need them. Uh, <clears throat> Like, I don't have a lot in Aramaic either, but I don't need them. Got some. So, Hulk, it's just this is my body. There's a difference, though, the, but I can't tell you the exact difference. Hawk is typically a, the neuter form of the demonstrative pronoun. But the word bread is, I believe, 
I think I said it was looked at it was masculine. So what is the issue with that? That is the whole issue. That is the whole issue. Uh, if you know Spanish, I'm sure French is the same. Uh, what else would be the same? Uh, Italian, Greek, Latin. You know, the, the Romance languages are, are gendered languages. So when you have an adjective, for example, in Spanish, the, the adjective, you have to use the, the form of the word, the gender form of the adjective to connect it with the, with the word it modifies in the same gender. So you have a, a connection between words that are built into the words. It's, it's a link between the words. The, the gender, the, uh, the equality of gender links words together. English, we use word order. In Spanish, in Latin, in, in Greek, word order is much less important. It's not, de word order doesn't truly determine that. It can, it, it tend to be approximate, but you can flip the, flipping the word order or putting things at the beginning of the sentence or the end of the sentence uh, in Spanish or in Greek, it has to do more with emphasis. So you like say something at the beginning of the sentence or the end gets a little bit more emphasis than what's in between often, not as a absolute rule, though. Whatever you do is what's true. <laughs> when it comes to language, how do you use it? So that's the importance of, in the Bible, for example, example uh, I looked up some on... on uh, a little bit on looked at a couple of websites on the Latin, but classical Latin, for example, what I sort of began to learn in junior high school, is not the Latin used in the Roman Catholic Church. The Latin used in the Roman Catholic Church is quite a bit uh, corrupted from that, so it's hard to say. It's like modern Greek has almost no connection to other than the alphabet, to, to ancient Greece, uh, Greek. And, and ancient classical Greek is not the same as Koine Greek that's in the, in the New Testament, or the Old Testament, for that matter, which is the Old Testament translation of the Bible into Greek, the LXX, otherwise known as Septuagint, is not exactly the same kind of Greek as the New Testament. There's a lot of words that are different. When I look them up, I, hey, it doesn't show. It's not in the dictionary. So let's go to this now, and I'll show you exactly what the issue is and why Luther may have not seen it, although he could have seen it in the Latin, apparently. So here, here is, uh, first of all, well, yeah, let's, let's, look at, let's look at the actual details here. Again, take, eat, this is my body. This is Matthew. Some of the Gospels and... Paul, they may expand this a little bit. Take it, take this. This is my body that is broken to you. Remember, the authors are writing down their recollection, and they don't always include everything. You shouldn't expect them to. So when somebody says, "Well, they're different," well, they're different witnesses. If all the witnesses were identical, you'd probably get the idea they copied everything from each other. They didn't. Because they're unique, it gives more authority to them. Two or more witnesses, not three identical copies. Okay, so the word in question here isn't is. It doesn't really deal with the, the issue. So let me highlight the phrase here. Again, the critical text, the uh, majority text, and the traditional text are Almost all the same. Uh, Stephon, interesting that the, uh, the King James is missing a letter. <laughs> it's SD, not S10, but it means the same. Uh, <clears throat> just a spelling variation. The Stephanus, which is, was one of the things used by the King James uh, editors, I'm sure, says uh, Tauto Estin to uh, Soma Mou which is the same as the others. But the King James says, Atauto SD. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so the King James only was to say, that's the right one. The others are all wrong. All those thousands and thousands of manuscripts in the majority text, they're all wrong. They're all wrong. King James is basically the majority text, but they had a handful of manuscripts. 
sort of the critical text people have a basically one manuscript critical text Vaticanus plus a little bit of Sinaiticus plus a sprinkling of papyri that's, that's what they are all come from one area all right so <clears throat> Why do they exist? Why don't we have older manuscripts of, say, what the King James source was, basically, the Byzantine manuscripts? Because of the environment. It has nothing to do with, you know, even even uh, vellum, animal skins, only last so long in a human environment. They last a lot longer in the deserts of Egypt and the Sinai, especially if they're not being used. Use breaks books down quickly, if you haven't noticed. So anyway, here's the, why am I playing with the with mouse wheel here? Tauto, right there, uh, the top line, Matthew 26, 26. Tauto esten to uh, soma mu, uh, mu. This is the body mine, literally. This is the body mine. So, uh, again, word order isn't an issue in the Greek because the words are connected by other things. One of those things is gender. That's a big one. So an adjective is connected to its noun by having the same gender. A pronoun is connected to its antecedent by being in the same gender. That's the issue that we look at here. So here is the word bread. Arton. The A, it looks like an A-P-T-O-V, but it's A-R-T-O-N. See, the, the P is a row. R. By the way, Russian sort of uses the same, uh, pretty much a similar al alphabet. Uh, the uh, well, sort of similar. <clears throat> Greek we reads the same way as English, by the way, from from left to right, uh, whereas Hebrew lead, reads from right to left. In case you're wondering, probably weren't. So. What did he? What he's he's talking? Well, he has the bread of the Passover, the unleavened bread in a, of, of the Passover in his hand. He takes it and he breaks it. It's like a tortilla, unleavened bread, uh, flat or or won't cook. I mean, it's flat. It's uh, a, a bit of oh, you could also think of a pita bread, but there's no leaven in it. Even tortillas tend to have a little leaven in them, a little baking powder or something. But you don't have to put it in there. Uh, but it's just flour and water. That's all that's in unleavened bread. And it was a bread of haste. They were uh, they had to leave quickly. They had to be ready to leave in a hurry from Egypt. So he takes the unleavened bread of the Passover. Now remember, the Passover is about God's delivering people out of the bondage of Egypt uh, to be His people, setting them free from bondage. But specifically, the Passover meal. It was the last plague, the plague of the on the firstborn. All the firstborn in Egypt, from the, the son of Pharaoh to the animals in the field, died unless they were in a house that had its door marked, the lintels and the doorpost, the lintel and the doorpost marked with the blood of a lamb, the Passover sacrifice, the Passover meal. The, the plague fell on the firstborn. I just thought the other day, hmm, it's interesting. Jesus was the firstborn. He's called the firstborn in many places in the New Testament, including the firstborn from the dead. And the, the, the plague of God on the cross, the punishment fell on Christ. He took our, our punishment for us. And we are protected because we're under the blood of the Lamb. And
And some people called dispensationalists don't believe that the Old Testament has anything to say to the church. I don't think they're right. They, they might accept that much of it. I think they say it doesn't refer to the, the church specifically. Yes, it does, you silly people. You just don't know the Bible. So what's the issue here? Our tone. So we have Tauto. What's the gender on Tauto? It's neuter. The, uh, the demonstrative, it it's actually is uh, over my head. You'll see the, the actual word. It's, it's hautos, that's the masculine. Haute is the feminine. And tauto is the neuter. Why it does that, I don't know. That's what languages are. Why does it change like that? But tauto is neuter. Neuter is often used in the Greek to refer to something a little abstract, like uh, the concept or a phrase. It's used in Second uh, in Ephesians chapter two, where it, where uh, Paul says, "For by grace you are saved through faith, and this not of yourselves." The this here doesn't refer to faith. It doesn't refer to grace because those are both feminine words. It's in the neuter. It refers to the entire phrase, by grace you are saved through faith. And that or this, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, lest anyone boast. So preachers, when they say, for example, a Calvinist might say, uh, yeah, see, that proves that faith is a gift. You have to be born again, regenerate in order to have faith in Christ. Well, that's not what it's saying. It says that whole God ordained that salvation would be by grace through faith in Christ. That doesn't come out of ourselves, out of ourselves, literally. It is the gift of God. It comes from God. Salvation is of the Lord. But it doesn't mean specifically that faith is a gift or grace is a gift. It means that entire idea from God is the gift. Salvation is the gift. Being saved by grace through faith. In Christ is the gift. That is the gospel, right? How we receive the gospel, how we receive what Christ did on the cross. So here again, uh, tauto is uh, neuter, and that would often refer to a concept like that, that whole phrase that has to do with that rather than a particular word. So it's something that is not a, a concrete object, like a person or, or a, a noun or a an object like that, but an idea. Now, <clears throat> here, what's the problem? Arton, bread, pan in Spanish, pretty much the same in Latin, is Latin, Spanish sort of comes from Latin, or Italian sort of does. Um, Spanish speakers can sort of understand Italian. Sometimes, I'll see something that's in Italian, and I, I think it's Spanish, until I, or pa Portuguese, another language, that you pretty much understand if you have Spanish. Not that I'm any good at Spanish either. So bread is masculine. See, right above my head there, you can see it right. Noun, accusative, that uh, uh, masculine. So he broke the bread, so it's the direct object of the breaking, I believe. Uh, masculine, singular, yep, from... Artos, so it's arton, because it's the uh, direct object, accusative. Okay, so that, that's how the words work, too. They, the, the ending of the word tells you what part of the sentence it goes to, whether it's the, the subject, the nominative, or the, or the accusative, or some other forms. So here we have arton, which is masculine, and this is neuter. So does it literally, did, did Jesus literally refer to the bread that he's holding in his hand? Do I have an object? There. So if, if this is a bread, so, and he says, this is my body. This is my, is, is the this, this? Or is it something that this represents, something associated with this, a concept associated with this as a symbol? Yep, the bread of the Passover. The, the bread of the Passover and the wine is a symbol of what? What God did in Egypt, the, the, delivering them from 
death, from bondage, bringing them in, out as his people. Doesn't he do that to us, for us? Jesus is referring to the Passover meal and says, uh, it's all about me. That was a foreshadowing of me. I am the blood, uh, the Passover lamb. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. My blood will be shed today, because it was today. The evening before was part of the day for the sins of the world. The true Passover, as the scripture says, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. So he was referring to the Passover and himself, his body being the sacrifice that covers our sins, that delivers us from the, the plague of death. The firstborn of God became the sacrifice, the sinless son became the sacrifice for the sinners. That's what it's about. It's not literally. The, script, the Greek does not say. It would say it differently. It would be, uh, let's see, what would it be? It would be, uh, if it was really, literally the bread. Let me put it up here where I should have it. It would be... Uh, Hautos. Well, no, it, well, that, I don't have the right ending on that. Would it be hauto? I don't know that stuff off the top of my head. So, it would be the the. Uh, no, this is a nominative. Yeah, so it would be hautos. Hautos. Uh, what? Hautos estin. Soma, mau, but it's not. He's not talking about the bread itself. He's talking about something the bread symbolizes, the Passover sacrifice. Yep. And I'll show you, just to verify. Now, I actually looked at the word hautos to, to try to see how they're used differently. And the, the masculine here, uh, for example, or the feminine would be the same way, tends to refer to a more concrete thing, whereas the neuter refers, unless it's referring directly to a neuter noun, it, it is uh, a, a concept or something like that would be what it refers to. That's the normal use. So uh, here, if we go, see, this is used, also this is used in, let's see, 20, Matthew 26, 26, we march, Mark. Mark 14, 22, and 24. Take, eat, this is my body. Take, uh, uh, in 24, he says, uh, uh, this is the blood of my new, uh, of the new covenant. The, the this here is the same usage, same word, tauto. And in Luke uh, 29, 19, it says, tauto estin also. Uh, and in Let's see, I like this one up. In Paul, when he gives his, this is what I received, he says, I take, eat, this is my body. Uh, his The word order is actually reversed. Remember I told you that a Greek word order is not that important. Uh, it says right here, tauto uh, mou estin to soma this uh, is my body. The word order jumps around there. Uh, okay. Uh, and it also goes on to say that, that, uh, that which is, um, well, he says broken, broken on behalf of you. See, he says, uh, to Hooper, that which is, uh, on your behalf is what this says right here. Huper is uh, on behalf of often, and this is, is here is uh, uh, humon, which is you plural. Okay. Now you know something. So if you talk to uh, to, Luth to Lutherans and to Catholics, because Lutherans are simply slightly Reformed Catholics, 
Catholic light, you can explain that to them. Or to your pastor, you could say, did you know this? Tell there's this old guy on YouTube that was talking about this. <laughs> Maybe you should check, you know, if he checks it out, he can figure that if he finds this out for himself, it's much better than he just takes it from, like if you find, if, it go, oh, if you're able to, go and look this up yourself. I mean, you can work through a, a, a concordance, a exhaustive concordance. A young's just easier to work for, work with in, in this kind of stuff because it, it goes by the words, the Greek words. Whereas the Strong's, you have to use the numbers and go back, you know, bounce around the numbers. But, yeah, you can do it the hard way, too. But now that you know what's there and you know something about language and gendered language, which was half the lesson. And, again, if, if you've tried to learn Spanish or something, or you know Spanish or any of the Romance languages, you know this stuff. You know this stuff. Most languages are gendered, so some of this stuff you know. But the idea, especially in the Greek, the, the neuter often refers to something more abstract, like a concept. Uh, unless there is a neuter, neuter word, not neutered, a neuter word that, are, that it, it links to because the gender is like a connecting, uh, a connection that links words together, as opposed to word order like English. But they're generally in the same area, otherwise they get confusing. If you had the, an adjective at the beginning of the sentence and the noun at the end, it'd be a little odd. It's like you might have several nouns of the same gender in between. I'm like, where is it going? The proximity counts then. But it's often before or after. It doesn't matter. Um, although it's written in a slightly different way in that case. Uh, adjectives are, at least. But here, uh, yeah, so the, our, the bread is just uh, the bread is masculine, and the word this refers to neuter, to a concept. Hmm. Could that be wrong anywhere? I don't know. Should I check first? What other nouns are there here? Remember, uh, none of them would make any sense because he had the bread in his hand. So no, that wouldn't even have to. Even if there was another noun that was neuter, it was what was in his hand because that's what he's referring to, and that's masculine, our our tone. So, no, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, but, yeah, so it's it's not, it's definitely not. The bread is not the potty. No, 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 no. It it's, refers to the Passover. That's what he's saying. The Passover bread, the unleavened bread of the Passover. Yeah, refers to his body, his sacrifice, which is what he identifies it with. Mm-hmm. I hope that was useful to some people out there. If you talk to Catholics and they want to bring this up, yeah, just tell them, well, the Greek says this. <sighs> this is what Jesus said. And they may say, they may say, uh, knowing what Catholics sometimes say or knowledgeable ones, but Jesus was probably speaking in Aramaic. And you could say, prove it. Well, they wouldn't be able to prove that, but they might try to. But the, the thing is, because the same form is used in uh, all uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and in 1 Corinthians, uh, <clears throat> the form being, uh, what is it, uh, Tauto Esten, why do they all translate it the same way if it was written in Aramaic? Unless Aramaic has the same structures. Why in the neuter? Why would you translate it into Greek in the neuter and link it with a masculine noun? <laughs> See, that, that explanation wouldn't make any sense at all either. It is what it is. It's not, this is my body, is not the, not the bread. It's what the bread refers to. What the bread is connected with, the Passover. I am the Passover, he was saying. Do this in remembrance of me, not Egypt, but in remembrance of me. So it is also an act of remembrance, remembrance of what he was about to do on the cross. Become our Passover lamb. 